Good morning and welcome to Salem Chapel. We're so glad you're joining us today. If you're new to Salem Chapel, we would love to meet you. Stop by our Welcome Center on your way out or visit salemchapel.org slash hello and one of our staff members will follow up with you later this week. On Christmas Eve, we will be having two identical services at 4 p.m. and 5.30 p.m. These in-person family services will be a special time for us to worship together as a church family. There will be no childcare, but you're encouraged to bring the whole family into the services as we reflect on the Christmas story. And on December 26th, there will be no in-person services. We will instead have a special online service for you to watch at home. You can learn more about Christmas at Salem Chapel by visiting salemchapel.org slash Christmas. You can learn more about these events and everything else happening at Salem Chapel by visiting salemchapel.org slash events. Church, let's stand as we enter into a time of worship together. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Salem Chapel. Uh, my name is Mark Duncan. I'm the pastor for discipleship here at Salem. I'm so glad that you are with us here today to worship, whether that's here in person or online. I also want to uh, say a special word of thanks to those of you that volunteered yesterday for our Christmas with Kimberly Park toy drive, and it was a huge success, and so many of you came out and gave of your time to really bless the families of the school there, and I know the staff and the teachers, some of them were actually here earlier in the first service, just wanted to express their thanks uh, for that as well, and we're so excited to see what God continues to do in that relationship. Well, church, as we uh, dive into God's word this morning, if you've been with us the past few months this fall, we've been doing a series through the book of John. So I'm gonna go ahead and encourage you, if you have a copy of God's word, to turn to John chapter five. That's where we'll be at uh, today. Uh, and as you are doing that, let's play a little word association game here. I'm gonna say a word, and when I say that, what's the first thing that comes to your mind. And if you are, you, you feel comfortable to say it out where you are, okay? So here's the word. The word is authority. What comes to mind? Leader. Leader. Heard that. What else? What do you think of when you think of authority? Power. power. I heard power a lot there, right? Yeah, leader, power. Let me ask you this, if you'd be honest on this, how many of you would say that the word authority conjures up uh, a negative response in you instinctively? Yeah. I think there's it's maybe on some level, all of us in one, in one stage of life or the next, have, and some of us had someone uh, that was in a position of leadership in our life that maybe did not lead well, right? They did not use the authority that they had or, or the responsibility to, to use the power well in the situation in which they served in their life. And so that in, in, upon us impressed negative impression of what authority often is because we've seen the failure of how it is used. When we have a positive understanding of authority, it's usually because we sense that that authority is operating in such a way that they are serving our interests. Like, would you say that? Like we can see authority almost like a, a security blanket when I know that they have my best interest at heart. That's sort of the idea behind authority is, is management of responsibility over a certain area. And when they are caring for the people that are benefiting from that and they perceive that they have their best interest at heart, authority is a good thing, right? Uh, I thought about... Um, this as well, the way that one exercises their authority, though, often gives an insight into the intentions of the heart, the way that they use that. I thought of this uh, very personal illustration of this this past week in my life. Uh, our family uh, moved this week uh, across town to the uh, illustrious metropolis of Walnut Cove. And so uh, I don't know that there's any other Walnut Coveites. I don't know if that's the right term or not. Here with us today, um, but uh, in moving there, of course, you know that you have the standard stuff when you move. If you've been there, where you don't know where anything is for like the first two weeks in your house, and I couldn't even find like my boots this morning, so I have no idea where those are. Um, as we're moving in, all the chaos of that, I believe the day before we actually closed on the house, uh, I realized for the first time after all of the visits to this house that we're buying and all of the time out there on the property that I had neglected to notice that there was something very important missing from the front yard. You know what it was? A mailbox. A mailbox. Anybody else had that realization when you moved into a house? It's an interesting realization. I never had uh, to consider 
is the, does the house have a mailbox? It's just not something you think about, right, when you're buying a house. That's, you're looking at, like, bedrooms and how many bathrooms it has and, like, what kind of land does it have? And then I'm, so we're, like, one day out from closing, and I'm like, there's no mailbox at this house. It's not by the street. It's not on the porch. And, and at this point, I've done what everyone's supposed to do, like they tell you to do, like a few days out. Go ahead and forward all your mail. So all of my mail, important things, you know, like, real estate documents and escrow checks and all that stuff that you don't really want to get lost in the mail. All that stuff is in transit to this new address that does not have a mailbox, all right? So I was like, well, can't be too hard to figure out a mailbox, right? Like, I mean, I know I can go buy one at Lowe's. Surely it's just a matter of like picking a spot where you want it and just kind of dig a hole and put it in the ground. But I was like, you know what I should probably do is do a quick little Google search and see maybe like what the procedure is. You probably have to let someone know you're going to do that. So I, I look up, well, I found out that it's actually kind of a complicated process to get a mailbox put in. Um, I found out that I was going to have to go in person to the uh, Walnut Cove post office and ask to speak to the postmaster directly to see if I could get permission to install a mailbox. And so I make my way downtown the next day, and I asked to speak to the postmaster. She's a very nice lady. And I told her where we were, and she's like, hold on, let me confirm that you're on one of our routes. And she, she did all of that, and she's like, yes, you're on uh, route number five, I think she said, um, but I can't actually give you the permission to put in the mailbox. And I'm like, why? Like, isn't, like aren't you the postmaster? Isn't that like, like the master part of the, of the title is? Like, you can give the permission. He's like, no, I mean, I can authorize your address to have a mailbox, but I can't tell you where to put the mailbox at. And I'm like, I'm confused. And she's like, here's the deal. Here's how it works. It's like, you're going to have to talk to your mail carrier on the route. They are the ones that will decide where is the best place to put your mailbox. They know where it's safe. They know where it makes sense for their vehicle. You're going to have to talk to the postal carrier to get the, the final word on where this is. And I'm like, okay. So uh, the postal carrier and I uh, had a very nice conversation with my mail person. I don't think I've ever had a, such a friendly conversation with a mail person before. She knew exactly where our house was. And I told her, I was like, well, I'd like to put it, you know, in this particular place by the driveway. And she's like, well, that's not really going to work for me. And I'm like, why? Everyone puts their mailbox by the driveway. And she's like, well, your driveway's on a corner. And it would kind of cause traffic issues if you put it there. And I'm like, well, where do you want to put it at <laughs> since you have to drive there? And she told me, she came up with another solution. And, you know, after more details of me putting a stake in the ground and her signing off on it and all that stuff, finally... We reached an agreement that in, under her authority, under her jurisdiction, that I could put my mailbox in this particular place. Then I asked her, I was like, so I have another question. What happens to the mail that was forwarded to the address, even though I don't have the mailbox in? She's like, well, she's like, to be quite honest, the typical rule is like, if it comes to the post office and it can't be delivered, it just gets returned to sender. She's like, but I don't have to do that. She's like, so I know that you're going to get this thing figured out. You seem like a really nice family. We're glad to have you here. Um, she was really kind of hung up on if she, if she could call me by my first name or if she had to call me pastor. I thought that was really cute. Like, you just call me Mark. It's okay. She's like, I'm just going to, she's like, how about I just collect your mail and hold it for you? And, and I can drop it off if you want me to. Or I can, you know, you can come pick it up at the post office. I was like, really? Would you do that? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, I can do that. I just thought that was such an interesting thing. And you're like, where in the world is this crazy mail story going? I just thought it was interesting that this, this lady had been given the jurisdiction and the authority over my mail. It wasn't the postmaster. I thought that was interesting. The postmaster said, no, it's going to be her. She's going to take care of it. And it was completely within her authority to do the bare minimum, right? Just to say, like, you can't put it there. You have to put it there. And I don't care what happens to your mail. That's not on me. But she took it a step further. Even though she was well within her rights to respond a certain way, she stepped outside of those rights to care for me in a small way, but an important way to take care of the male. And so we're talking about this idea of authority today. We're looking in John chapter 5. We're going to be in verse number 18. Jesus has what is, is perhaps the longest dialogue in Scripture consistently where he talks about 
his authority? What are his rights as the son of God? But not just that, he also reveals his intentions. You know, because remember, like I said at the beginning, authority can feel like a scary thing if I don't know what the intentions of the person is that's over me in authority. But when I do know that their intentions for me are good, then that authority transfer, translates into something very different, into a safety net. And so the way that someone uses the authority will reveal the care or their position towards the individual that they serve. So the question I want to ask you before we jump in to the passage this morning is what authority, what authority does Jesus currently have in your life? Where does he rank in authority in your life right now? Which areas of your heart, which areas of your life does he have the right to be who he is? And are there other areas of your heart where you're wrestling with that? Because Again, if we're being honest with that, many of us don't like the idea of an authority over us. I think, at least, I can get along pretty well on my own and make the best call for myself. You can call that an American thing, I don't know. It's just a stubborn thing. That's a human condition, that we want to be our own authority. So sometimes, even talking about the authority of Jesus in our heart can seem like he, it's crossing a line that, is, that shouldn't be there, that should not be allowed to happen. So I'm going to ask you just to consider, where are the areas where he's allowed to be an authority, and where are the areas that he is not? And so as we look in uh, John 5, I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory of what happened just before verse 18, because that's important. If you, you may be familiar with this story. Jesus had gone to the pool of Bethesda, which is a place where a lot of people with various medical conditions would, would gather. And they, the reason they would gather there is because there was some kind of uh, thought process, some kind of rumor that there was a spiritual thing going on there, that if people got into this water, when it would suddenly start bubbling at the pool of Bethesda, that they could receive healing if they got there first. And so obviously everyone that had any kind of of injury, any kind of ailment would show up at the pool with us to try to be the first one there. And if you recall, Jesus came there that day and went up to a lame man who was just laying there, essentially saying, there's no way I'm ever going to make it. Right? And then Jesus on the spot heals the man. Right, and he, and he jumps up and Jesus is like, pick up your bed right, and, and go home. Take it with you. But then Jesus gets himself in a little bit of trouble, doesn't he? Because the Pharisees, the spiritual leaders of the day, were standing by watching what was going on. And they didn't even pay attention to the fact that there was a man over here that hadn't walked his entire life who is now jumping around like he's got brand new legs. They're not focused on that at all. You know what they're focused on? They focused on the fact that Jesus was working on the Sabbath day. How dare you do work on the Sabbath day? Don't you understand the laws that you are breaking? Don't you understand that you have offended God in heaven because you have broken the Sabbath day? And so that's, that's kind of setting the stage where Jesus continues his conversation, sort of a defense of his authority which is important for us to, to be reminded of, but then also later, how that, what that, how that really plays out in my heart and how he wants to give life and speak life into the areas of my heart where I'm resisting his authority. So let's pick up in verse 18. I'm gonna read 18 through 24 first, so hang on with me in this. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Right? So they're screaming blasphemy. How dare you say that he is your father? How dare you associate with what he is doing? So, verse 19, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him. Why? You may underline this part. So that you may marvel. So that you may marvel. So you may be astonished, blown away. 21, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one. He has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And then focus on this verse here. Truly, truly, I say to you, 
Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. In this, this passage that we read here, there are five aspects of Jesus' authority clearly on display. And I'm just going to give, us, give it to us real fast here. We'll talk about it for just a second, and then we'll get into what that means for us today. Here's the first one. The Son is dependent upon the Father. The Son is dependent upon the Father. He says, the Son, verse 19, can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. What he's speaking to there is, is that relationship that existed before time where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all coexisted in this weird dynamic that's really honestly hard for us to wrap our mind around where we have three distinct persons of God, yet one God. Not three gods, not big, middle, and little God, like three, three persons in one God. In, in, in unity and in fellowship before time existed. The Son depends upon the Father because they exist in relationship together. They are, they are the same and he is dependent upon what he is doing. Now you even look in those relationships though and you see that they don't necessarily have the same functions though, right? Because you have God the Father who is overall and then you have God the Son who came to this earth, put on flesh, performed a very important function of going to the cross and dying for sin, and then the Father raised him up again, right? And he's the one that will rule over all. And then you have the Holy Spirit who does what? He shines the spotlight on the Son. Everything he does points back to Jesus, right? That's what they do. They each serve in their own way, but they're not unequal in the fact that they are God. So the Son is dependent upon that. They exist in fellowship. Here's the second aspect. The Son has the same plan as the Father. He has the same plan. They don't have competing agendas where Jesus is like, I'm going to go do this thing and the Father is doing this thing. That's important for us to remember. Just to back that up in the verse there, verse 20, the Father loves the Son, shows him all that he himself is doing, all right? This is the plan that we're working on, just to, just to put to rest, not this idea that in the, the Old Testament of Scripture, sometimes we're tempted to think like God, the God of the Old Testament is a very different guy from Jesus in the New Testament. They don't seem like they're on the same page. So what do we have there? We have, do we have two different like, kinds of gods going on here? Jesus is like, no, not at all. The Father and I have been about the same plan since the beginning of time. From the very first moment, that the very first person chose in that, in that moment to assert their authority over God's and say, I know what you have said is right for me, and I'm choosing to make my own decision in this moment. When sin came into the world and brokenness entered into the lives of people, in that moment where God has said, now death has come, in the same breath, in the same paragraph, Genesis chapter 3, he says, but there will come one who will crush the head of sin and death forever, right? The, the, the plan, we, we call that redemption, right? That was the plan all along. The God of the Old Testament wasn't doing a different thing. All of the things that God said were right in the Old Testament, Jesus affirms and agrees with in the New Testament. They're not on a different page, right? Just because Jesus comes across maybe in the Gospels as this like really compassionate and loving figure doesn't mean that God the Father is somehow disconnected from compassion and love. He's the definition of love, right? So they, they have the same plan. Here's the third one though. The Son has the same power as the Father over life and death. Verse 21, as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Make no mistake if you remember the, the first chapter of John, when, when we looked at it in, in the first verses where it says, in the beginning was the word. That was talking about Jesus. Jesus was in the beginning with God the Father. That means he was involved in the creation of life as we know it, like physically. He helped speak. He spoke it into existence. He literally breathed life into the first human being, and they became a living soul. Jesus was actively involved that he gives life. He's physically giving life today and sustaining this universe. That is, that is an active thing that he is doing. But it's not just physical life that he gives. If you were here last week, we looked at the picture of the, the woman from Samaria at the well. 
And Jesus made an offer to her in that moment when he said, if, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for a drink and I would give you something called living water. I would give you life that you had not understood before. To, to quote John 10, I will give you an abundant life, a life that overflows its bounds because it's not based on what you can accomplish or what you can do for yourself or just getting through the week. It's accomplishing what I'm doing. So Jesus has the same power as the Father to bring what is dead spiritually to life. Like he's involved in that process. It's not like he's taking a back seat. He has compassion uh, for us before we have a relationship with God to pursue, to challenge, to call, and then to initiate and to bring to life, right, what was dead Ephesians 2 says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. You can't, something that is dead cannot self make it come back to life again. And Jesus is involved in that process of bringing people to life. And this is the fourth one. The Son has the same authority as the Father to judge. All right, 22. Father judges no one, but has given all the judgment. To the Son, God has every right. God the Father has every right to judge sin. He defined what is right. He, he's the one that set the boundaries and the guidelines for what that is. No one else tells him what that is. He's the only one that stands faithful and true to be able to make proclamation to say, this is right or this is wrong. But what's interesting in this passage is that Jesus says the Father has given that judgment to the Son. I find that really interesting. God the Father delegates the judgment, identifying sin and, and calling it for what it is and prescribing the punishment for that. He gives that to the Son. Kind of reminded me of that postmaster lady again. She's like, yeah, I don't, you can have a, you can have a mailbox, but you're going to have to let the other lady do that. She handles that kind of stuff. That's the Father's doing here. Why would God the Father give Jesus the right to be the judge? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus was the one they came down and put on flesh. And he walked among us. He experienced life like we experience life. He's the one that can make, the, can make the call to say, this is right, this is wrong. He's the one that stands there. But because he is in relationship and in our midst and presence, God gives him the right to make the call on that. So he has the right to be the judge, to sit there in all of his glory and prescribe what he wants to. He has that right. He's so Jesus is going down the list on all these things. And then the last, the last aspect, he says here, is the son deserves the same worship as the father. Verse 23, why does the father do this? That all will honor the son. They respect Jesus for who he is, just as they honor the father. Important statement here. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. See, the Pharisees there that day that are hearing this, their whole lives, from their perspective, were about honoring God. They didn't really go about it the right way. We'll get into some of that in a little bit later. But like that, that was the focus of their life. At least that's what they wanted to be known for. These are people that are designated in, in our community that they just, they're sold out for God. They're, they're living their whole life under, under God's authority. And yet when Jesus comes, the Son of God, they don't want to have anything to do with him. In fact, they accuse him of wrongdoing. And Jesus makes it very clearly, I, I have every right under my authority to demand that you worship me for who I am. I have every right in this moment when you're accusing me of blasphemy to pronounce judgment upon you. God the Father has given me that right. I have every right to take away the gift of life that I gave to you. But does he do any of that? And I think that's really important for us to, to understand about Jesus is that Jesus has this authority. That's not a question. These are, these are aspects of, of who he is because he is God. And yet, despite that, he still puts himself in relationship with people like you and me. And though he is able to pronounce judgment, as remember from John chapter 3 and verse 17, he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but why? That the world through him might be saved. And he restates that in verse 24 when he says, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, that person has eternal life. 
They do not come into judgment, but they have passed from death to life. Why is Jesus going through all the hassle of explaining his authority to these Pharisees and, and, and by extension to us today? If he's not actively going to act on those things right now in this moment, why is he going through the pains of explaining that? I'll tell you why, and this is kind of our big thought for today. Jesus, if you recall back in, in verse 20 at the end, I told you to underline that part, greater works than these we show them so you may marvel. Jesus is inviting us to marvel at the breadth of his great authority so that we might comprehend the depth of his great love. He's wanting us to see, not to, not to shame us. He wants wanting us to have a reality check of this is who I am. This, these are, this is my resume, right? These are my credentials. This is what I bring to the table. I don't go around telling everybody that they need to respond to me in this way, right? And I don't go around like pronouncing judgment on every person that walks by because I would literally be doing that all day long to everybody. I have the right to, but I didn't come to do that. I came here so that people like you, people like me, could find grace and find forgiveness and find life that only Jesus can give. See, it's a marvelous paradox that Jesus is saying here. He's telling the story of a righteous judge who always wants the guilty to go free. Now, if we applied that concept to our judicial system, we'd be like, whoa, it's kind of a little weighted, you know? A little biased system there. If there's someone guilty, they need to pay the price, right? Jesus makes it very clear. God makes it very clear through all the scripture. He came to save lives. Everyone was guilty. This is not about like identifying who's guilty. This is about identifying who's going to receive life. That's why Jesus wants us to marvel. He wants us to be amazed that, that God, in his fullness represented in Jesus, all the things that I just said, that's a reality for who he is. And he came to this earth, as we said earlier, as that little baby. We focus on that aspect so much right now, but we should be focusing ever bit as much as the Jesus in Revelation that is standing there on the throne, so bright that you can't look at him because it's the same guy. And it's the same guy in all of his glory and all of his authority, and he, yet he still says, come to me and find life. He doesn't bring the judgment up in my face. He wants me to be he says to marvel, right? To literally be astonished. One of the Bible words I love is this word, like this word awe. We don't use that word very often anymore. We say awesome a lot for a lot of things that aren't awesome. This idea of like it's breathtaking to me. That not God, like many God, but like the fullness of God. All of his rights. That he would set those rights aside perhaps to focus on me so that I might have life. That should humble me to the core. It should humble you to the core. It should blow us away every single day when we wake up with that reality that today he wants to be with me and it's not because I'm really that great to be around. It's because he wants me. He chose me. I'm valuable to him. He wants you to marvel at that. That authority Remember what I said, like when, when we can trust the intentions of the authority, that kind of changes the reality of how it plays out in our life. Well, I'm going to give you three things real quick here. Three ways that Jesus' authority offers to give life to dead hearts. Dead hearts, you know, people like you, people like me, that before Jesus we were just bumping along, just living our life, just trying to get through things. And these are three ways kind of that, that Jesus' authority gives a different answer than that. So this is the first one. I'll give it to you right out of the gate. Jesus' authority offers definition for the heart who has a distorted view of God. Offers definition for the heart who has a distorted view of God. I want you to skip down. Jesus continues his discussion here so much so he goes into like different witnesses that speak to what he has. He's looking at scripture. He's looking at John the Baptist. He gets down to verse number 37. That's what we're going to pick up here. He talks about the, the father himself being a witness. The father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard. 
His form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one in whom he has sent. Without Jesus standing between me and the Father, making a way for me to know him, there's literally no way for me to understand who God is. I don't have a clear perception of what that is. I don't know if you remember. Some of you are not going to remember this because you didn't have these when you were uh, younger. But like when I, I remember distinctly when we moved from tube televisions to flat screen HD TVs. Right? And just the difference in quality. When you like turn on the news and like all of a sudden you can like see like every facial blemish in the uh, newscaster's face. And I'm pretty sure they had to like adjust like screen makeup after that because there's way too much detail. You can see, remember that? And you remember like a few years later when it moved up to like 1080p and then it was like 4K and now it's like you can see, now I think there's like, I don't know how many Ks there are now, but it's like pretty much you're just like there, it's that clear. Like every, what is happening every generation with those TVs? It's further coming into focus. Right, like what was, what was blurry, what was out of focus is now coming into focus. Jesus' authority is giving definition to the very image of God. He's giving a voice and a vision of a God that I could never see or hear on my own. You remember that, I don't know if you've heard that poem before. It's really kind of used as an example of like, you know, from, from, a, from a secular perspective, like, hey, religions are really all the same thing. You've heard that poem of, like, an, an, an el- six blind guys standing around an elephant, right? And, like, they're each kind of touching a different part. It's, it's always sort of said, like, well, this guy that's touching the nose, he says that this thing is, is no, it's, it's a snake. You know, it feels like a snake. And this guy's touching a leg, so he says, well, it's like a tree. And the guy on the end's got the tail, and he's like, no, no, you're all wrong. It's actually a rope. You know, and, and it's sort of like, ha, huh, see, like, you can kind of make up your own version of what that is. But I've always found that really interesting because there's one person who definitely knows that it's an elephant. And that's the person that's observing what's going on, right? The narrator of the whole thing is like, they're standing around an elephant. You know who the narrator is? You know who the author is? What, is, what does Scripture call Jesus? The author of life. If there's one person who knows what God is like, is it not Jesus? Without Jesus in the mix, without him being the template for how God operates, what God thinks about me, what God says is true, without him there to be that model for me, what do I do? I can make up my own version, right? I can make up a very distorted version of who God is. You know, it may be that I see God as angry, Because my father, growing up, used to just be angry all the time or used to abuse me. And so I've transferred my image of who God is based off of how he responded to me, right? Like that's that's a very real thing that we can grapple with. Or maybe that's I see God as weak because he didn't stop uh, my friend or my family member from passing away. They didn't make it. And I don't understand. I thought God loved me. I thought God loved people. Why would he let something so evil and, and difficult happen in our lives? I can let that frame my perspective of God. I can let, maybe it, was, maybe it was an experience with some pastor that used to preach the evils of sin from a pulpit, but if he didn't share the good news of grace. Grace. We can all take those experiences, and and honestly, that's what we do left to our own devices. We take our experiences, and we let those things shape who we think God is. And we form our actions and our decisions and our life based around those assumptions, because that's what feels right to us. That's why Jesus stands there in his authority as the Son, in the fullness of God, and he's like, I'll tell you exactly who the Father is like. Like, look at me. We're the same. Right? Did you see Jesus? What was the bulk of his ministry when he was on this earth? What was he doing? He was going to hang out with the people that nobody cared about. He was over with the woman that was caught in adultery when everyone else had abandoned her. And he was comforting their, her, her in that moment. He spent time for for people that no one else had any thought to care for. He served them, and he served us when he willingly went to that cross. 
people spitting at him, people shouting at him, being beaten, publicly shamed and hung up there in a a very public way to die. He never complained about it. He never told all of them what a big mistake they were making. He never demanded that they all fall down. You all will worship me in this moment. Don't you know who I am? He never did any of that. Because he's obeying the Father. He's like, you want to know what the Father is like? Maybe you today, you want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. Jesus is the clearest definition of that. His authority gives definition for my heart when I have a, a distorted view. I can go to what, his example and see what God is like. When we see Jesus correctly, we are seeing God correctly. But this is the second thing his authority offers. It offers rest for the heart that strives to avoid judgment by its own merits. Remember, he's talk, Jesus is talking to Pharisees. Again, these are people that are religious Leaders of the time, they, they did their best to live their life according to the Torah. And in fact, they, they kind of took it even further in the extreme. They started making up their own rules and laws based off of what God had said and made things actually harder for people to follow. They're like, they're like this, this law that God said is actually not strict enough. We need to make it stricter. That's where the whole, like, you can only walk so many steps on the Sabbath day or it's considered working. Right? So they were going around with their little clipboards being like, how many steps did you walk today? Let's look at, let's look at your step counter. Yep, you, you broke the law, you know? Checking that off. That's what they would do. They thought, if I, just, if I just read the scriptures well, if I just know what God is saying and get all that information in, then that's going to be what I need to impress God. And Jesus calls that out in verse 39. He says, You're ser- you search the scriptures. You search the scriptures because you think that in them... Like the act of searching them, you have eternal life. But it is they that are bearing witness about me. Yet you've refused to come to me that you may have life. Here we have the most educated people of the day. I would even venture to say that many of the Pharisees know the Old Testament better than you or I do. They memorized it. They walked around with it like literally written on little pieces of paper, hung on their bodies. It was all over the place. They had it in their life. Jesus is not calling them out for being diligent to read his word. So don't misunderstand that. I am definitely for us reading God's word, okay? If I'm the discipleship pastor here, that's a good thing to be in God's word. But what is, what is the problem where we get into trouble with that is they thought that reading, just reading the word, doing the things... Right? Going around town and flaunting the things they were, and they thought that was the point of it all, was to, to act like I've got it all together, to put on this presentation that I'm, I'm a holy person. They're trying to avoid God's judgment just based on their own merits. And I'll tell you what, friends, like many times you and I do the same things. We may not do it in the same way as the Pharisees. But in some ways in our mind, we justify to ourselves, if I can just get my act together here, God, then I feel like I have you over a barrel to do the thing that I want you to do. And so I just need to impress you with with the things that I can accomplish in my behavior, and maybe then you'll look on me. And Jesus is like, that's not what I came to do. That's not what it's about. If you actually read the Bible that you brag about so much, you would realize that from the very beginning, it was talking about what I was going to do. And it's not based upon how many rules you keep. Because you can't keep the rules. Like that was the point of the law that God gave to Moses. It was actually a very gracious thing that God did when he showed how much we break his laws. You think about that? God didn't have to expose us to understand that. He literally wrote it down on tablets. It's like, here's how you're breaking the laws. Here's how you're violating my holiness. Why would he do that? It feels so like heavy. Is God just trying to beat up on us? Is he trying to make us feel bad? No, he was trying to point to what he was going to do. Jesus is going to be the law keeper because you can't keep the law. You don't have to be burdened down by, did I go to church enough? Right? Did I keep up with all of the chapters in the reading plan at Salem Chapel? Will someone know if I skipped a day of quiet time or not? I don't know if I prayed through all four movements of the prayer tool today. Does that mean it didn't count? That's not what Jesus, he's like, you're missing the point. The point is about abiding with me. 
Remembering who I am. I am God. And I want to be with you. I want to be with you in your brokenness. Because I want you to find life not in, in ritual or routine or religious practice, but in relationship with me. But like the Pharisees, he called them out in verse 40, you, they refused to come, and I think we do the same thing. And I'm like, but God, that, that offer of grace, you say in Ephesians 2, that by grace you've been saved through faith, that doesn't seem like that's enough. Doesn't it need a little extra cherry on the top? Wouldn't that really just kind of push it over the edge if I just really impressed you with this? And she's like, you're refusing life. And you're striving for something that's going to be an an endless pursuit of frustration. He says, come, come to me that you may have life. One of my favorite verses in Matthew 11 says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you what? Rest. Rest. It's a very different thing that Jesus is offering than what the Pharisees were offering. The Pharisees are like, yeah, come with us and we'll give you more stuff to do. And maybe you can keep up with us, maybe you can't. You may not be as holy as we are. Jesus is like, just come as you are to me. I will give you rest. I will give you life. I will receive you as you are and show you what I'm going to make you to be. The last one, the last way that Jesus' authority speaks to dead hearts is that his authority offers acceptance for the heart that is paralyzed by a desire to be wanted. It's paralyzed by a a desire to be wanted. 41 says, I do not receive glory from people, as Jesus is saying here, should point out that he could receive glory from people if he wanted to. He's like, I'm not doing that. But I know that you don't have the love of God within you. I've come in my Father's name and you won't receive me. If another would come in his name, you would receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, but you do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? What's he calling out there again? He's saying you you spend so much of your time and your life focused on improving yourself and elevating yourself above other people or getting validation from other people. It's so important to you that you you have the same things that your neighbor has. It's so important to you that you have these certain accolades that you can hang on your wall and point to all these achievements that you've accomplished. You have so much value and time tied up in worrying about, does someone misunderstand me? Have I offended them? How am I I going to make make them impressed with me again? And we waste so much time. I do that. You do that. And that's something that I wrestle with all the time. Seeking glory that is not mine to seek. I used to work with student minister, students and student minister for a long time. And I have to stand up for middle schoolers in this statement because I think everyone accuses middle schoolers of this, of being incredibly insecure and like flitting from thing to thing to thing to try to find out what their tribe is, right? Like, well, today I'm interested in this kind of activity. And today I'm interested in this type of music. And today I'm interested in this kind of clothing. And I think we give middle scores a bad rap because the reality is we all do the same things. It's just different stuff. Right? We have different, different things later. We are so wrapped up in identifying ourselves in. We want glory, we want identity, we want validation. I believe Romans 1 gives us a really clear picture of why that is. It says, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him but they became futile in their thinking and foolish, their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of an immortal God for images. Jesus is like, under my authority, I could demand that you worship me and that would be well within my right. Under my authority, I could point out very specifically and cast judgment on you when your heart is swayed by something else. Like when you care more about what that coworker thinks about you than what I think about you. When you are more concerned about having a certain lifestyle than you are about 
what I want to do in your life and what my plans are. I could do all of that in my authority. But I want to invite you into finding who you really can be in me. And that the greatest desire of your heart would not to make more glory for yourself, but to come under my authority and be a bigger part of the story that I am writing that rightfully brings glory to my name. He's like, that's where you're going to find life and freedom. When you feel paralyzed by, who am I? What am I doing here? What am I accomplishing? How do I measure up? He's like, you don't need any of that. He said, come under my authority. Let me give you rest in that and let me, let me show you who I want you to be. Let me show you what I am doing in that. Jesus invites us to marvel at the breadth of his authority, all of those things we said at the beginning. He has rights to all of that. He wants us to be amazed by that, to be amazed that we could, be, that we could know him at all so that we might have a greater awareness of the depth of how much love it took for him to come into our place, to put on flesh, to live among us, to experience life as a human being, but then to offer something much more powerful. And at this time of year, we often go to Isaiah and we look at how Isaiah gave the name to Jesus as, as Emmanuel, right? Which literally means what? God with us. And he lose sight of the fact of how amazing that is. That he would be where we are. That he would give up everything so that we can be with him. Are you hearing his word this morning? I asked you that question at the beginning. Where are you refusing the authority of Jesus in your life today? Are you receiving the life that he offers are you satisfied with that? Or are you still trying to define it on your own terms? It's very simple. Jesus doesn't have like a 10-step process. Each and every day, he just says, come. Come. Believe me. Let me give you life. And marvel at it. Marvel at what I'm going to do. Will you pray with me this morning? God, I think sometimes the reason we're not marveling every single moment of every single day at who you are and what you've done is because, honestly, we don't really think we're that bad off. God, we think about the reality that you stand, God, as authority over all, And yet you want to be intimately involved in each of our lives. And God, you tell us what is best for us, that it's, that it's to come to you, that it's to take our, our burdens to you, it's to find rest at your feet, it's to stop striving and start abiding. And yet, God, we refuse. God, open our eyes afresh. God, May we marvel this week at all of the aspects of who you are as God. And thank you that, that we have access to you because of Jesus, that we can see your face and hear your voice because of Jesus, that we have freedom because of Jesus, because we have identity because of Jesus. And we pray, God, as we respond, that it were, would give you much glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray this confidently. Amen.